Okay, so uh, let's get step by step. Uh, first, we're talking about ion channels. So, uh, why do we have ion channels? Because ions are charged particles. So, as we know, charged particles would be repelled from the cellular, cellular membrane. Generally, the charged particles would not get through on their own. So, they need a specialized structure that would enable them to get through. Those uh, <coughs> specialized structures are the ion channels and, of course, the pumps. So, we have the passive and active transport. But generally, the passive transport for ions uh, are the ion channels. Uh, we have different types of ion channels, as most of you mentioned in your answers. Uh, so, uh, but first of all, what are the common factors for uh, the ion channels? The ion channels are generally some proteins in the cellular membrane that are selective. What does it mean that they are selective? It means... Uh, wait a moment. So, what is important here? Important fact is that the ion channels are highly selective. What does it mean that they are selective? It means that only some type of ion would get through. For example, only sodium ions, only potassium ions, only calcium ions, but not sodium and potassium, not sodium and calcium, not sodium and chloric ions, and so on. Of course, it's not always like that, but in most of the cases, those channels would get through only one type of ion, yes? Sometimes two, sometimes more. As I said, it changes. But in most of the cases that you would see in uh, physiology, they would get only one ion through. Uh, those channels uh, can also be uh, modified a bit. We can add to the channel some receptor. Uh, so, the receptor, as uh, you already know, is something that responds to a stimuli. A stimuli may be anything, yes? And as a stimuli for a receptor, it may be anything, as we have different types of uh, gating of the channels. What, what do I mean by gating? We have, for example, the ligand gated channels. The ligand-gated channels are the channels that will open or close depending on the ligand that is activating or inhibiting the receptor. So, ligand-gated channels are channels controlled by the receptor for which a stimuli is a ligand. Uh, Voltage-gated channels are the channels that will open or close when the voltage will change. So we have some receptors that are able to feel the changes um, in the electric field around. And when those changes would happen, they would open the channels, for example. We have also some mechanically gated channels. So for example, in our fingers, yes, we have some, not only in the finger service, but this is just the example. Uh, we have some uh, touch receptors that would re respond to the changes uh, of the physical shape of the cellular membrane. And when those changes in the shape would occur, we, they will open the channel. And there are some channels that are always open. Also, uh, we need to know that there are also some, some other types of the channels, like the gap junction channel. Those gap junction channels are generally, you can think about them, as a connection between cytoplasm of two cells. So, of course, it's too big, as yes? those gap junction channels are, are very tiny. But generally, the gap junction channels are connection between those two cells. Uh, for example, uh, they are used in electrical synapses, or there are connections between the heart cells. So, <clears throat> when we need a very fast uh, communication between two different cells, we have those gap junction channels. Okay. 
Uh, okay. We also um, no, just to I did not ask about this, but we will get it here. So we also have different types of the symport, antiports, uh, yeah, and uniports. So when we have a symport, it means that we have one particle of one type, other particle of the other type, and they both would get through the same uh, protein, yes, through the same channel, generally speaking. This is a symport. We have also the uniport that the only one would get through. We have also the antiport when one would get in one direction, the other would get in the other direction. Yes. This is a general idea. Symport, uniport, antiport. The very 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 simple thing. Okay. And now we also uh, I also asked you about exocytosis, endocytosis and transcytosis. So uh, endocytosis endocytosis, sorry. Let's draw show this is a cellular membrane, yes, this is a big cell. Uh, when it, it occurs that there is some big particle, for example bacteria that the macrophage would want to eat and kill, it's too big to get through any structure in the cellular membrane. Yes, it would not fit it. It's too big. So what would happen? It would get oh, I know what I do. It would get generally next to the cellular membrane. Then the cellular membrane would flex. Yeah. Yeah, as you can see, then uh, it would flex even more. Yeah, and after some time, all of it would get. <coughs> Uh, all of this particle that was previously outside of the cell would be inside of the cell, but all of it would be also um, surrounded by the cellular membrane. Yes? And we created some vesicle. This is the end endocytosis. Uh, if you would get in the opposite direction, so we would release it, so we'll get this one, yes, would get to the cellular membrane, so it would attach to the cellular membrane and would release what it had. It is the exocytosis. It's also for big things that we have inside. If we would combine the endocytosis and the exocytosis, it is a transcytosis. So usually it looks like that, that there is some, something outside, big, cell wants to have it inside. It uses endocytosis. Uh, sometimes uh, the cells are able to produce big uh, particles that are needed somewhere else, yes, some big molecules. Uh, they use exocytosis to get them out. Sometimes the cell wants to pass through itself some big particles and in order to achieve this it uses transcytosis. Okay, I suppose for today it would be enough.